Asimov's Science Fiction, October-November 2008. Copyright 2008 by Dell Magazines. Read by Michael Scherer. This magazine contains 240 pages. Approximate reading time, 12 hours 40 minutes. This magazine contains markers allowing direct access to the contents and articles at level 1 and to the sections at level 2. This recorded edition contains the entire text of the print edition, except for advertising. This magazine was produced for the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, Library of Congress. Table of Contents Departments Editorial The 2008 Dell Magazines Award Sheila Williams Page 4 5 Minutes Reflections Beaming It Down Robert Silverberg, page 8, 13 minutes. On the Net, Alternativity, James Patrick Kelly, page 12, 14 minutes. Novellas, The Airdman Nexus, Nancy Crass, page 16, 183 minutes. Short Stories, Listening for Submarines, Peter Higgins, page 72. 43 minutes. Prayers for an Egg, Sarah Genge, page 86, 23 minutes. Poetry, The First Dancers, Michael Meyerhofer, page 93, 1 minute. Novelettes, Defending Elysium, Brandon Sanderson, page 94, 100 minutes. Short Stories, Money is No Object, Leslie Watt, page 125, 8 minutes. Poetry, Return of Zombie Teen Angst, Mike Allen, page 127, 1 minute. Short Stories, Do Luma No More, Gord Seller, page 128, 40 minutes. Novelettes, The English Mutiny, Ian R. MacLeod. Page 140, 54 minutes. Poetry, Goodbye Billy Goat Gruff, Jane Yolen. Page 155, 1 minute. Short Stories, Cat in the Rain, Jack Skillingstead. Page 156, 35 minutes. Poetry, A Crisis of Forest, Sandra Lindau. Page 167, 2 minutes. Novellas Truth, Robert Reed, page 168, 175 minutes. Departments On Books, Post Genre Speculative Fiction, Norman Spinrad, page 225, 44 minutes. The SF Conventional Calendar, Erwin S. Strauss, page 238, 9 minutes. Next issue. Page 240, 3 minutes. Editorial by Sheila Williams. Reading time, 5 minutes. The 2008 Dell Magazines Award. After 15 annual trips to Fort Lauderdale in conjunction with the Dell Magazines Award for Undergraduate Excellence in Science Fiction and Fantasy Writing, which is annually bestowed by Dell Magazines and the International Association for the Fantastic in the Arts, I found myself in Orlando, Florida, on March 18, 180 miles north of the world's spring break capital. The new location held no side trip to Disney World for me, however. I was too busy holding story consultations with our award finalists, as well as attending the conference's readings and panels. My co-judge, Rick Wilbur, and I had an unusually strong crop of stories to choose from. With so many good stories, we decided to expand our circle of semi-finalists over most other years. On Saturday night, I bestowed the award and the check for $500 on the winner, Stephen Leach of the University of South Florida, and handed out certificates to our finalists. Stephen, who had placed as an honorable mention in the contest in 2007, won this year's award with Blank, White, and Blue an extremely funny and well-researched tale that displayed a great leap forward in plotting and control. Stephen's story will appear on our website next year. In the meantime, please look for The Uncanny Valley by last year's winner, Natty Bokenkamp, 
Natty's story is up on our website now. Seth Dickinson, a second-year student at the University of Chicago, was this year's first runner-up with his story, Hypocrite. Like Stephen, Seth was also an honorable mention in last year's contest. In addition to his certificate, Seth will receive a two-year complimentary subscription to Asimov's. Our second runner-up was Jeremy Figgins, a student of science fiction author John Kessel at North Carolina State University. Although Jeremy couldn't be in attendance, he received a certificate and a one-year subscription to Asimov's for his story, An Acre in the Woods. Another finalist who couldn't be in attendance was our third runner-up, Rebecca White of the University of Auckland. If she had made her way from New Zealand to Florida to pick up her certificate for Girl Wonder, Rebecca would certainly have also won the award for furthest distance traveled. Two of this year's honorable mentions could not be on hand to receive their citations. These students were Casey Orrell, another student from North Carolina State University and the author of Fly True, and Sarah Miller of Bard College at Simon's Rock, who wrote Clockwork Angels. Fortunately, we did have the delightful chance to meet Emily Tursoff of Bard College, who was the author of Stay With Me. Besides spending time with some of the contenders for the Dell Award, I also had a chance to hang out with a number of SF authors. In addition to visiting with regular conference-goers like James Patrick Kelly, Ted Chang, John Kessel, Kathleen Ann Goonan, Eileen Gunn, and Brian Aldiss, I got to spend some quality time with conference newcomers like Judith Moffat and Robert J. Sawyer. Over drinks, Werner Vinge and I discussed the science and music in a story by a brand-new author named Gord Suller that Werner had critiqued at the Clarion West Writers' Workshop and that I'd scheduled for the July 2008 issue of Asimov's. It's new writers like Gord and Stephen and past winners of the Dell Magazine's award who will take science fiction into its unpredictable future. We're now actively looking for next year's winner. The deadline for submissions is Friday, January 2, 2009. All full-time undergraduate students at any accredited university or college are eligible. Stories must be in English and should run from 1,000 to 10,000 words. No submission can be returned, and all stories must be previously unpublished and unsold. There is a $10 entry fee, with up to three stories accepted for each fee paid. A special flat fee of $25 is available for an entire classroom of writers. Instructors should send all the submissions in one or more clearly labeled envelopes with a check or money order. Checks should be made out to the Dell Magazine's award. There is no limit to the number of submissions for each writer. Each submission must include the writer's name, address, phone number, and college or university on the cover sheet, but please do not put your name on the actual story. Before entering the contest, contact Rick Wilbur for more information, rules, and manuscript guidelines. He can be reached care of Dell Magazine's Award, School of Mass Communications, University of South Florida, Tampa, Florida, 33620, R-W-I-L-B-E-R, -E at cas.usf.edu. Next year's winner will be announced at the 2009 Conference on the Fantastic in the pages of Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine and on our website. Captioned Photograph Seth Dickinson, Rick Wilbur, Stephen Leach, Sheila Williams, Emily Tursoff. Reflections by Robert Silverberg. Reading time, 13 minutes. Beaming it down. The idea of beaming electricity down to Earth from satellites in space is back in the news, now that worldwide concern over global warming is bringing about some rethinking of our current ways of generating power. Power plants that burn coal, oil, or natural gas create combustion product problems. Nuclear power plants have spooked certain segments of the population since the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl events of a generation ago, though the fact that they are actually quite safe these days and have none of the emission problems of fossil fuel plants has begun to attract support for them, even from environmentalists who long opposed them. Hydroelectric power and wind power are also carbon-free, but generating them involves building giant dams or covering great swaths of land with windmills, which engenders ecological problems of its own. The use of solar power panels also is land-intensive, and in any case is suitable only where long hours of sunlight can be consistently counted upon. And so, since the relentless rate of growth and annual demand for electrical power is unlikely to slow down in the years ahead, 
The concept of shipping power down from space is getting major attention these days, nearly eighty years after it first turned up in science fiction. One big backer this time around is the Pentagon, which issued a report in October 2007 asserting that beaming energy down from space satellites would provide affordable, clean, safe, reliable, sustainable, and expandable energy for mankind. Those powerful political buzzwords are to be found in a 75-page study conducted for the Defense Department's National Security Space Office, which has been examining potential energy sources for worldwide U.S. military operations. The Pentagon people do note, however, that although the technology for building such space-based power plants already exists, the cost of lifting thousands of tons of apparatus for collecting and transmitting the energy into space would be formidable. While the Defense Department ponders the budgetary aspects of such a project, the tiny Pacific nation of Palau, 20,000 inhabitants scattered over a cluster of islands, is ready to go ahead. Palau got involved after the American entrepreneur Kevin Reed, speaking at the 58th International Astronautical Congress in India in September 2007, suggested that Palau's Helena. Short of rummaging through dozens of fragile old magazines, I have no way of knowing whether Hugo Gernsback planted the seed that led to Power Planet. But it is just as likely that Leinster, the inveterate gadgeteer and demonstrably ingenious author of dozens of strikingly original science fiction stories, came up with the idea of power satellites on his own. In any case, the credit for introducing the idea to science fiction, and doing it in so presciently plausible a way, must go to him. Will such power planets be built? I think they will. Not immediately, maybe, but diminishing fossil fuel supplies on Earth, and ever-expanding electricity demand, make it inevitable, perhaps not in my lifetime, but quite possibly in yours, and certainly in your children's. And remember, Murray Leinster said it first. We welcome your letters. They should be sent to Asimov's, 475 Park Avenue South, Floor 11, New York, New York, 10016, or emailed to Asimov's at dellmagazines.com. Space and time make it impossible to print or answer all letters, but please include your mailing address even if you use email. If you don't want your address printed, put it only in the heading of your letter. If you do want it printed, please put your address under your signature. We reserve the right to shorten and copy edit letters. Fearofthefuture.blogspot.com forward slash 2007 forward slash 05 forward slash alternate hyphen history hyphen of hyphen Chinese hyphen science dot html which is part jape and part literary criticism. Writing as Wong On Nuan, one Jess Nevins, geocities.com forward slash rat m m j e s s, lists the most influential SF books of the last hundred years, from 4600 to 4700. For those of you who are wondering, this is the year 4705 in the Chinese calendar. He reviews such classics as Bai Ai Tan's A Princess of Mars, 4609. No one will ever call Bai Ai Tan a great writer, and parts of A Princess of Mars have aged badly, but A Princess of Mars and the other Barsoom stories still carry a certain pulp charge. Of Bei Ao Lan's The Star's My Destination, 4653, he writes, All Bay and Stars did was capture the mood of SF fans impatient to reach the stars before the Americans. He restates the obvious in his discussion of Kong Wong Lian's Neuromancer, 4681. Kong didn't create cyberpunk, or even coin the word, but Kong's enormous success, far more than Shu Bin Rong's, spawned a decade of imitators. The cover art accompanying the reviews is priceless. Give this essay a click for insight mixed with chuckles. Exit. Like so many of you, I love A.H. Some of my dozens of fans, hi mom, may be wondering why I haven't dipped into this vibrant genre. I have, but you've never heard about it. You see, I have a parallel career up here in Chile, New Hampshire as a playwright, and in 2005 my full-length play The Duel had its world premiere with nine performances in Portsmouth and two in Manchester. Here's my what if. Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton fight their famous duel, but they both miss. 
Result, the Civil War breaks out fifty years early, except the North secedes from the South. Okay, you're dubious. Google the Hartford Convention, en.wikipedia.org forward slash wiki forward slash h-a-r-t-f-o-r-d underscore convention and think about it. You see, I enjoy the game as much as the next guy. The Erdman Nexus Nancy Crass Reading Time, 183 Minutes With stories already published in over a dozen languages, Nancy Crass continues to go global this year as the new columnist for the Chinese Science Fiction World magazine. In addition, this winter she will spend a semester in Saxony as a guest lecturer for the University of Leipzig. Despite all the extra work, Nancy still has three new books coming out in the remaining months of 2008. One novel, Steal Across the Sky, tour December 2008, should be of interest to readers of the Erdman Nexus, since it takes a deeper look into the unknown regions of the human psyche that are explored here as well. Asimovs would also like to congratulate the author for winning the 2007 Nebula for her novella Fountain of Age, July 2007. Errors the spine up his back and into his brain. Mild, but definite, like a shock from a busted toaster or something. Then it was gone. What the fuck was that? Was he okay? If he fell like Anna... He was okay. He didn't have Anna's thin, delicate bones. Whatever it was, was gone now. Just one of those things. On a nursing floor of St. Sebastian's, a woman with just a few days to live muttered in her long, last, half-sleep. An IV dripped morphine into her arm, easing the passage. No one listened to the mutterings. It had been years since they'd made sense. For a moment she stopped, and her eyes, again bright in the ravaged face that had once been so lovely, grew wide, but for only a moment. Her eyes closed, and the mindless muttering resumed. In Tijuana, a vigorous old man sitting behind his son's market stall, where he sold cheap sarapes to jabbering turistas, suddenly lifted his face to the sun. His mouth, which still had all its white flashing teeth, made a big O. Oh. In Bombay, a widow dressed in white looked out her window at the teeming streets, her face gone blank as her sari. In Chengdu, a monk sitting on his cushion on the polished floor of the meditation room in the ancient Wenchu monastery shattered the holy silence with a shocking, startled laugh. 2. Carrie Vesey sat in the back of Dr. Erdman's classroom and thought about murder. Not that she would ever do it, of course. Murder was wrong. Taking a life filled her with horror that was only... Ground-up castor beans were a deadly poison made worse by her daily witnessing of old people's aching desire to hold on to life. Also, she... Her stepbrother had once shown her how to disable the brakes on a car. Knew she wasn't the kind of person who solved problems that boldly. And anyway, her... The battered woman defense almost always earned acquittal from juries. Lawyers said that a paper trail of restraining orders and ER documentation was by far the best way to... If a man was passed out from a dozen beers, he'd never feel a bullet from his own service revolver. Put Jim behind bars legally. That, the lawyer said, would solve the problem. As if a black guy and a broken arm and constant threats that left her scared even when Jim wasn't in the same city were all just a theoretical problem, like the ones Dr. Erdman gave his physics students. He sat on top of a desk in the front of the room, talking about something called the Bose-Einstein condensate. Carrie had no idea what that was, and she didn't care. She just liked being here, sitting unheeded in the back of the room. The physics students, nine boys and two girls, were none of them interested in her presence, her black eye, or her beauty. When Dr. Erdman was around, he commanded all their geeky attention, and that was indescribably restful. Carrie tried, unsuccessfully, she knew, to hide her beauty. Her looks had bought her nothing but trouble. Gary, Eric, Jim. So now she wore baggy sweats and no makeup, and crammed her twenty-four carat gold hair under a shapeless hat. Maybe if she was as smart as these students, she would have learned to pick a different kind of man, but she wasn't, 
and she hadn't, and Dr. Erdman's classroom was a place she felt safe, safer even than St. Sebastian's, which was where Jim had blackened her eye. He'd slipped in through the loading dock, she guessed, and caught her alone in the linen's supply closet. He was gone after one punch, and when she called her exasperated lawyer, and he found out she had no witnesses and St. Sebastian's had security, he'd said there was nothing he could do. It would be her word against Jim's. She had to be able to prove that the restraining order had been violated. Dr. Erdman was talking about proof, too, some sort of mathematical proof. Carrie had been good at math in high school. Only Dr. Erdman had said once that what she'd done in high school wasn't mathematics, only arithmetic. Of course, Carrie didn't know. She didn't know the doctor either, but she rushed over to him, leaving Dr. Erdman leaning on his walker by the main entrance. Are you a doctor? I'm Carrie Vesey, and I was bringing Dr. Erdman, a patient, Henry Erdman, not a medical doctor, home when he had some kind of attack. He seems all right now, but someone needs to look at him. He says, I'm not an M.D., the man said, and Carrie looked at him in dismay. I'm a neurological researcher. She rallied. Well, you're the best we're going to get at this hour, so please look at him. She was amazed at her own audacity. All right. He followed her to Dr. Erdman, who scowled because, Carrie knew, he hated this sort of fuss. The non-MD seemed to pick up on that right away. He said pleasantly, Dr. Erdman, I'm Jake DeBella. Will you come this way, sir? Without waiting for an answer, he turned and led the way down a side corridor. Carrie and Dr. Erdman followed, everybody's walk normal, but still people watched. Move along, nothing to see here. Why were they still staring? Why were people such ghouls? But they weren't really. That was just her own fear talking. You trust too much, Carrie, Dr. Erdman had said just last week. In a small room on the second floor, he sat heavily on one of the three metal folding chairs. The room held the chairs, a gray filing cabinet, an ugly metal desk, and nothing else. Carrie, a natural nester, pursed her lips, and this Dr. DeBella caught that too. I've only been here a few days, he said apologetically. Haven't had time yet to properly move in. Dr. Erdman, can you tell me what happened? Nothing, he wore his lofty look. I just fell asleep for a moment, and Carrie became alarmed. Really, there's no need for this fuss. You fell asleep? Yes. All right, has that happened before? Did Dr. Erdman hesitate ever so briefly? Yes, occasionally. I am ninety, doctor. DeBella nodded, apparently satisfied, and turned to Carrie. And what happened to you? Did it occur at the same time that Dr. Erdman fell asleep? Her eye. That's why people had stared in the lobby. In her concern for Dr. Erdman, she'd forgotten about her black eye, but now it immediately began to throb again. Carrie felt herself go scarlet. Dr. Erdman answered, No, it didn't happen at the same time. There was no car accident, if that's what you're implying. Carrie's eye is unrelated. I fell, Carrie said, knew that no one believed her, and lifted her chin. Okay, DeBella said amiably. But as long as you're here, Dr. Erdman, I'd like to enlist your help. Yours and as many other volunteers as I can enlist at St. Sebastian's. I'm here on a Gates Foundation grant in conjunction with Johns Hopkins to map shifts in brain electrochemistry during cerebral arousal. I'm asking volunteers to donate a few hours of their time to undergo completely painless brain scans while they look at various pictures and videos. Your participation will be an aid to science. Carrie saw that Dr. Erdman was going to refuse, despite the magic word science, but then he hesitated. What kind of brain scans? Asher Payton and functional MRI. All right, I'll participate. Carrie blinked. That didn't sound like Dr. Erdman, who considered physics and astronomy the only true sciences and the rest merely poor stepchildren. But this Dr. DeBella wasn't about to let his research subject get away. He said quickly, Excellent. Tomorrow morning at eleven, Lab 6B, at the hospital. Ms. Vesey, can you bring him over? Are you a relative? No, I'm an aide here. Call me Carrie. I can bring him. Wednesday wasn't one of her usual days for Dr. Erdman, but she'd get Marie to swap schedules. Wonderful, please call me Jake. He smiled at her, and something turned over in Carrie's chest. 
It wasn't just that he was so handsome, with his black hair and gray eyes and nice shoulders, but also that he had masculine confidence and an easy way with him and no ring on his left hand. Bits of cloth hanging on the walls, a curtain of beads instead of a door to the bedroom, Hindu statues and crystal pyramids and Navajo blankets. Henry disliked the clutter, the childishness of the decor, even as he felt flooded by gratitude toward Aaron Bass. She had released him. Her ideas about the incidents were so dumb that he could easily dismiss them, along with anything he might have been thinking which resembled them. "'There's an energy in the universe as a whole,' she'd said. "'When you stop resisting the flow of life and give up the grasping of Trishna, you awaken to that energy. In popular terms you have an out-of-body experience, activating stored karma from past lives and fusing it into one moment of transcendent insight.' Henry had had no transcendental insight. He knew about energy in the universe. It was called electromagnetic radiation, gravity, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and none of it had karma. He didn't believe in reincarnation, and he hadn't been out of his body. Throughout all three incidents, he'd felt his body firmly encasing him. He hadn't left. Other minds had somehow seemed to come in. But it was all nonsense an aberration of a brain whose synapses and axons, dendrites, and vesicles were simply growing old. He grasped his walker and rose. "'Thanks, anyway, Mrs. Bass. Good-bye.' "'Again call me Aaron. Are you sure you wouldn't like some green tea before you go?' "'Quite sure. Take care.' He was at the door when she said, almost casually, "'Oh, Henry, when I had my own out-of-body Tuesday evening—' There were others with me in the awakened state. Were you ever closely connected with, I know this sounds odd, a light that somehow shone more brightly than many suns? He turned and stared at her. This will take about twenty minutes, Debella said as Henry slid into the MRI machine. He'd had the procedure before and disliked it just as much then, the feeling of being enclosed in a tube not much larger than a coffin. Some people he knew couldn't tolerate it at all. But Henry'd be damned if he'd let a piece of machinery defeat him, and anyway the tube didn't enclose him completely. It was open at the bottom. So he pressed his lips together and closed his eyes and let the machine swallow his strapped-down body. "'You okay in there, Dr. Erdman?' "'I'm fine.' "'Good. Excellent. Just relax.' To his own surprise, he did. In the tube everything seemed very remote. He actually dozed, waking twenty minutes later when the tube slid him out again. "'Everything look normal?' he asked Debella, and held his breath. "'Completely,' Debella said. "'Thank you. That's a good baseline for my study. Your next one, you know, will come immediately after you view a ten-minute video. I've scheduled that for a week from today.' "'Fine.' Normal. Then his brain was okay, and this weirdness was over. Relief turned him jaunty. I'm glad to assist your project, Doctor. What is its focus again? Cerebral activation patterns in senior citizens. Did you realize, Dr. Erdman, that the over-65 demographic is the fastest-growing one in the world? And that globally there are now 140 million people over the age of 80? Henry hadn't realized, nor did he care. The St. Sebastian's aide came forward to help Henry to his feet. He was a dour young man whose name Henry hadn't caught. Debella said, Where's Carrie today? It's not her day with me. Ah, Debella didn't sound very interested. He was already prepping his screens for the next volunteer. Time on the MRI, he'd told Henry, was tight, having to be scheduled between hospital use. The dour young man, Daryl, Darren, Dustin, drove Henry back to St. Sebastian's and left him to make his own way upstairs. In his apartment, Henry lowered himself laboriously to the sofa. Just a few minutes' nap. That's all he needed. Even the graphs, fingerprints, a search of the one-room apartment, with her consent. You have the right to remain silent. She didn't remain silent, didn't need a lawyer, told what she knew as Jim's body was replaced by a chalked outline and neighbors gathered in the hall. And when it was finally, finally over, and she was told that her apartment was a crime scene until the autopsy was performed and where could she go, she said, St. Sebastian's, 
I work there. Maybe you should call in sick for this night's shift, ma'am. It's... I'm going to St. Sebastian's. She did, her hands shaky on the steering wheel. She went straight to Dr. Erdman's door and knocked hard. His walker inched across the floor inside, inside where it was safe. Carrie, what on earth? Can I come in, please? The police? Police? he said sharply. What police? peering around her as if he expected to see blue uniforms filling the hall. Where's your coat? It's fifty degrees out. She had forgotten a coat. Nobody had mentioned a coat. Pack a bag, they said, but nobody had mentioned a coat. Dr. Erdman always knew the temperature and barometer reading. He kept track of such things. Belatedly, and for the first time, she burst into tears. He drew her in, made her sit on the sofa. Carrie noticed, with the cold, clear part of her mind that still seemed to be functioning, that there was a very wet spot on the carpet and a strong odor, as if someone had scrubbed with disinfectant. Could I... could I have a drink? She hadn't known she was going to say that until the words were out. She seldom drank. Too much like Jim. Jim. The sherry steadied her. Sherry seemed so civilized, and so did the miniature glass he offered it in. She breathed easier, and told him her story. He listened without saying a word. "'I think I'm a suspect,' Carrie said. "'Well, of course I am. He just dropped dead when we were fighting. But I never so much as laid a hand on him. I was just trying to protect my head, and—' "'Dr. Erdman, what is it? You're white as snow. I shouldn't have come. I'm sorry. I—' "'Of course you should have come,' he snapped, so harshly that she was startled. A moment later he tried to smile. Of course you should have come. What are friends for? Friends. But she had other friends, younger friends, Joanne and Connie and Jennifer. Not that she had seen any of them much in the last three months. It had been Dr. Erdman she'd thought of, first and immediately. And now he looked so... You're not well, she said. What is it? Nothing. I ate something bad at lunch in the dining room. Half the building started vomiting a few hours later. Evelyn Crinch noted, and Gina Martinelli, and Aaron Bass, and Bob Donovan, and Al Cosmano, and Anna Chernoff. More. He watched her carefully as he recited the names, as if she should somehow react. Carrie knew some of those people, but mostly just to say hello. Only Mr. Cosmano was on her resident assignee list. Dr. Erdman looked stranger than she had ever seen him. He said, Carrie, what time did Jim... did he drop dead? Can you fix the exact time? Well, let me see. I left here at two, and I stopped at the bank and the gas station and the convenience store, so maybe three o'clock or three-thirty? Why? Dr. Erdman didn't answer. He was silent for so long that Carrie grew uneasy. She shouldn't have come. It was a terrible imposition. And anyway, there was probably a rule against aides staying in residence apartments. What was she thinking? Let me get blankets and pillow for the sofa, Dr. Erdman finally said, in a voice that still sounded odd to carry. It's fairly comfortable for a sofa. 6. Not possible. The most ridiculous coincidence. That was all. Coincidence. Simultaneity was not cause and effect. Even but ideas, all easily disproved, but of course that stopped no one from believing them. The few old people left said almost nothing. Those that did were scarcely believed. Jake scarcely believed it himself. He did nothing with the brain scans of Evelyn Crinch noted, and the three others, because there was nothing plausible he could do. They were all dead anyway. Only their bodies, Carrie always added. She believed everything Henry Erdman told her. Did DeBella believe Henry's ideas? On Tuesdays he did, on Wednesdays not, on Thursdays belief again. There was no replicable proof. It wasn't science, it was something else. DeBella lived his life. He broke up with James. He visited Henry, long after the study of senior attention patterns was over. He went to dinner with Carrie and Vince Garassi. He was best man at their wedding. He attended his mother's 65th birthday party, 
a lavish shindig organized by his sister in the ballroom of a glitzy downtown hotel. The birthday girl laughed and kissed the relatives who'd flown in from Chicago and opened her gifts. As she gyrated on the dance floor with his Uncle Sam, Debella wondered if she would live long enough to reach eighty. Wondered how many others in the world would reach eighty. It was only because enough of them chose to go that the rest of us lost the emerging power, Henry had said, and Debella noted that them instead of us. If you have only a few atoms of uranium left, you can't reach critical mass. Debella would have put it differently. If you have only a few neurons, you don't have a conscious brain. But it came to the same thing in the end. If so many hadn't merged, then the consciousness would have had to— Henry didn't finish his sentence, then or ever. But Debella could guess. Come on, boy, Uncle Sam called. Get yourself a partner and dance. Debella shook his head and smiled. He didn't have a partner just now, and he didn't want to dance. All the same, old Sam was right. Dancing had a limited shelf life. The sell-by date was already stamped on most human activity. Some day his mother's generation, the largest demographic bulge in history, would turn eighty, and Henry's choice would have to be made yet again. How would it go next time? Listening for Submarines Peter Higgins Reading time, 43 minutes. Peter Higgins lives in Wales. His work can be found in Zahir, Revelation, Fantasy Magazine, Fantasy the Best of the Year 2007, and Best New Fantasy 2. Of his first tale for Asimov's, he says, Very little of this story is made up. I was trying to capture the particular atmosphere of a time and place when it seemed to many people that the world really might end, at any moment. A facility like the one described in this tale did operate for twenty-one years, on one of the most ancient, strange, and beautiful stretches of the Welsh coast. Google I-U-S-S-C-A-A. -A. Listen to the sound. See the photos. Lieutenant Christopher Osgerby, R.N., lay in the dark, listening. The wall between his bedroom and Sarah's was flimsy plasterboard. He pulled the bed covers closer and turned over. The was steep and difficult in the half-light. There was a fine rain falling that made the stone slippery. He had to watch where he put his feet and hold knotted roots of gorse for balance. When he reached the beach of sharp jagged rocks and shingle, there was no one to be seen. The tide was halfway out. He could hear the waves breaking on the shore. He stumbled forward, calling, Sarah! Sarah! As he rounded a high black rock, she spoke to him. You can't follow me, Chris. She was standing naked in the rain. She looked thin and cold. The rain had smoothed her black hair over the shape of her head and down her narrow shoulders. A trail of it fell across her face. He saw the fine goosebumps on her arms and the faint blue-pink mottling of the flesh on her legs. Her dark eyes were looking at him with no expression that he could read. Go home, she said. You're going to the island. I have to go now, Chris. Because you told me. Because I know. It's my fault, isn't it? It's what I want. But I want it, too. I have the gift, too. The sound of that song, it's inside me now. I can't get rid of it. And I've got nowhere else to go. I can't go back. They want me to— At the base they know what's out there. They'll come looking. Maybe I can help. Chris, I'm sorry. It was the same old story. You see her and you need her, and because you need her you lose her. That's how it always is, for the men on the shore. She wakes up something inside you that never goes back to sleep. It drives you on forever. You spend the rest of your life looking for her. But you can never actually have her. Chris, I'm not— Whatever you think I am— You've made a mistake. She turned away from him and walked out into the purple-gray water. He watched her until the swell rose against her breasts, and she leaned forward into it and began to swim. Her sleek, dark head turned to look back at him for a moment. He thought he could see her wide, whiteless brown eyes observing him, like seals sometimes did when he walked on the beach. Then the sea closed over her. 
Christopher stood, shivering, watching the dull gray swell. It had begun to rain. There was a thunderous, rattling, clattering, mechanical roar behind him. He ducked instinctively. A Sea King helicopter roared out over the cliff top, flying low, heading out into the bay. Prayers for an Egg, Saragangue. Reading time, 23 minutes. Saragangue is a Spanish doctor living and working in Madrid. She has sold short stories to Strange Horizons, Helix SF, Cosmos Magazine, Apex Digest, Weird Tales, and a few others. Sarah is a co-founder and regular contributor to www.dailycabal.com, a blog of speculative microfiction. She has participated in Villa Diodati 1 and 2, a pan-European spec fiction workshop for writers living outside the States who don't get the chance to go to regular science fiction conventions. In her first story for Asimov's, the author sets us down on another planet for a hard look at alien biology and social customs. Food at the back door so that the beater won't come knocking. Lassa sits by the basin and cleans out her pouch, removing the crusted yolk and broken shell. She rocks back and forth and hums to herself. She even laughs a little, though she doesn't know what is so funny. Her body moves automatically, while she herself is far away. The women look at each other and start muttering that she's going mad. They expect her to grieve, but Lassa doesn't know how to begin. Guilt and pain have not caught up with her yet, but she senses them creeping up on her and she wonders how she'll be able to live with what she's done. In the meantime, Lassa clutches her belly. She has her secret. The First Dancers Reading Time, One Minute It horrified me in fifth grade to read how ancient jellyfish evolved into stomachs with fangs and biceps, mosquitoes sporting javelins for stingers, Educated men, knotting yellow stars to arms, still soft with baby fat. Whittle a few hundred million rings from the trunk of our world's history, then behold the iridescence of king-sized jellyfish, fanning the deep, their feelers curling and uncurling, with a grace reserved for invertebrates. Before the Amazon fell to loggers, long before kindling, much less stoves, Picture schools of these peaceful dancers roaming the depths, gelatin comets, gumming plankton. Then one grows a tooth. It begins. It cannot be stopped. Michael Meyerhofer Defending Elysium Brandon Sanderson Reading Time, 100 Minutes Brandon Sanderson grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. He became an avid science fiction fantasy reader at the age of 15, and later decided to try his hand at writing. Brandon has published the Mistborn Trilogy with Tor, and a middle-grade fantasy series, the Alcatraz Smedry Books, with Scholastic. He is currently at work on A Memory of Light, Book 12 in the Wheel of Time series, which he was asked to complete after the passing of author Robert Jordan. Brandon teaches a creative writing class at Brigham Young University. He lives in Provo, Utah, with his wife Emily and son Joel. In the author's first story for Asimov's, his hero must match wits with aliens and saboteurs while defending Elysium. The woman thrashed and spasmed in the hospital bed. Her dark hair was matted to her head with sweat, and her uncontrolled motion did not investigate a murder. Then, speaking louder, he continued, I'm certain the local law enforcement is competent. Let them investigate. The PC can handle diplomatic negotiations. The officer looked surprised, but apparently, uncertain what else to do, he saluted Jason. Jason nodded, then turned to leave. Not that the diplomatic negotiations will be too hard, Lana noted. The Varvaks are so insanely docile that they'll probably apologize for inconveniencing one of our murderers. They're all like that, Jason said, stepping out onto the building's front steps. That's the big problem, isn't it? There was a moment of shocked silence as the reporters realized who he was. They stood in a ring around several beleaguered police, 
and the commotion was attracting a crowd of curious onlookers. Then the reporters exploded with questions. Jason ignored them, pushing his way through the crowd. He had his head bowed, his hand raised, to forestall questions. However, in his mind he was looking. He scanned the crowd, pushing through the humming and pulsing colors. He studied each face, comparing them to the ones in his memory. A smile crept to his lips as he found what he was after. The media let him leave. They were used to the PC ignoring their questions. Behind him, Jason could hear their on-the-spot vidcasts. They had all the facts wrong, of course. There was fear in their voices. A fear of what they didn't understand. A fear of the retribution that might come. In their world, retribution was assumed. In their world, you hurt that which was weaker than you. Jason continued to walk with his head bowed. Behind him, a man broke free from the group of onlookers and wandered in Jason's direction, obviously trying to look casual. I wish there were more flowers, Jason said. A second later, a click sounded in his ear. Then Lana sighed. What took you so long? she demanded. I've been waiting for you to do that ever since you got off the shuttle. I feel creepy knowing someone's hacking our line. Jason continued to stroll forward. His shadow followed. The man moved with the skill of one who had been well trained, but he made the mistakes of one who was inexperienced. There was no change to his step. He probably hadn't noticed the switchover. At that moment, he would be listening to a fabricated conversation between Lana and Jason. For some reason, Jason suspected he didn't want to know what kind of silly things Lana's replicated version of his voice was saying. Is he buying it? Lana asked. I think so, Jason said, walking away from the slums. He's still following. Who do you think he's with? I'm not sure yet. Jason turned, taking the steps down into an air train station. The man followed. If you caught him this quickly, he must not be very good. He's young, Jason said. He knows what he's supposed to do, but he doesn't know how to do it. A reporter, Lana guessed. No, Jason said. He's too well equipped. Remember, he managed to hack into a secure FTL comm. One of the corporations? Maybe, Jason said, strolling into an underground cafe. It smelt of dirt, mold, and coffee. His follower waited for a few moments outside, then walked in and took a table a discreet distance from Jason. Jason ordered a cup of coffee. We haven't even discussed how he managed to scan your disk, Lena noted. You're losing your edge, old man. I'm not old, Jason mumbled as the waitress brought his coffee. It smelt of cream, though he had ordered it black. He turned his ineffectual eyes on a newspaper someone else had left on the table, but his mind studied his follower. The man was indeed young, in his early twenties. He wore softly humming grays and browns. So, Lana said, do you want to try and get me a visual so I can look him up? Jason paused. No he said finally, taking a sip of his coffee. It had far too much cream in it, probably an attempt to obscure its poor flavor. They certainly are confident, aren't they? Lana asked in his ear. They have reason to be, Jason replied. It has always happened as they expect. A race discovers FTL cytonic transmission at the same time it achieves a peaceful civilization. If only they weren't so cursed ingenuous, Lana said. A part of me kind of wishes I had three Varvax diplomats, a card table, and a host of useless technologies I could cheat out of them. That's the problem, Jason said. There's a little of that in all of us. What if they're wrong, Jason? Lena asked. What if we do get FTL travel before we're civilized? Jason didn't reply. He didn't know the answer. I looked up the kid for you, Lena offered. Go on, Jason said, rising and gathering his things. The attack the day before still had him worried. Was it an attempt to scare Jason off? From what? The day you left, a young UIB agent named Colm Abrams disappeared from the Bureau's training facilities on Jupiter-14, Lena said. He stole some sophisticated monitoring equipment. The UIB put out several warrants for him, but they aren't looking this far. Apparently they didn't expect him to make it all the way to Evensong. It isn't exactly a prime vacationing spot, 
Jason noted, strolling over to the window and trying to imagine what the city would look like to normal eyes. It would be dark, he decided. Most of it didn't vibrate very much to him at all. Dark and tall, like a city constructed entirely of alleyways. Lights were sparse and insufficient, and the air smelt musty. It always seemed to be a few degrees below standard temperature, too, as if the vacuum of space weren't closer, more ominous, than it really was. So, Lana said, we've got a wanted felon. Can we turn him in? No, Jason said, turning from the window and putting on his suit coat and sliding on his dark glasses. Come on, let's turn him in, Lana said. In fact, it was probably the UIB who tried to have him killed yesterday. They don't work that way, Jason said, walking to the door. Do you have my permit secured? Yes, Lana said. Good. Turn the kid back on and let's get going. The image was blurred and poorly exposed. Unfortunately, it was the best he had. Cone walked around the large hollow image, studying it as he had hundreds of times before. The answer was before him. He could feel it. The image held a secret. Yet Kahn, like thousands of others, was unable to determine just what that secret might be. The image had been taken by the only spy to infiltrate the PC's central headquarters. It was a picture of a simple white room with an apparatus lining the back wall. That apparatus, whatever it was, powered all of humankind's FTL communications. It was the greatest secret of the modern age. Humankind had been trying for nearly two centuries to break the PC's monopoly on FTL communication. Unfortunately, no amount of research had been able to duplicate the PC's strange technology, and until someone did, humankind would be indebted to a tyrant. It has to be here, Cone thought, staring at the unyielding image. He walked around it to look at several angles. If only it weren't so blurry. He looked closely at the hollow image. A security guard sat against the right side of the room, staring in the photographer's direction. There seemed to be several cylindrical outcroppings on the far wall, relays of some kind, one was larger than the others, and dark in color. Was it the answer? Colm sighed. Men far more technologically savvy than he had tried to dissect the image, but none had been able to draw any decisive conclusions. The picture was just too fuzzy to be of much use. He had spent the entire morning trying to decide why someone would try to kill him. He had only been able to come to one decision, that for some reason Wright had ordered him assassinated. The PC agent had been the one who had it as he finished the bandaging. The man was trustworthy, one of the first cytonics Jason had recruited over a hundred years before. "'Excuse me, Jason of the phone company?' Son asked after a short pause. His hands were pulled back in the Varvac sign of confusion. The medic left, and Lana sat down beside Jason. She watched Son with calculating eyes. She had never liked the Varvacs. She said she didn't like people who could so easily falsify their body language. The ambassador? The one who died, Jason said. He was a discontent. I have him now. I thought humans were trying to infiltrate Varvac society. I didn't realize that it was the other way around. Your dissidents are escaping, and they're hiding amongst us. They're trying to get hold of human technology. We're still uncivilized, Son. We have some war machines that could blast down your ships without even pausing. Son maintained his sign of confusion, then augmented it with one of worry. Few people knew that the Tanasi ambassadorial vessel that had been shot down over Earth had been one of the most advanced, most powerful ships in the galaxy. A single human missile had destroyed it. The other species had far inferior technology. This is disturbing, Son admitted. I know, Jason said. Then he reached over and cut the connection. Son's face fuzzed and disappeared. Jason leaned back with a sigh, sensing Lana beside him. He'd known it was coming. He'd feared that he couldn't keep humankind out of space. He just hadn't expected heaven to fail him. I'm sorry, Lana whispered. Jason shook his head. You always warned me that I was too idealistic. I wanted to believe you anyway, Lana said. She slowly trailed her hand along his cheek. 
Do you think the one who attacked you was the only one? Not a chance, Jason said. He was too confident. Then... Jason took a deep breath. Prepare a press release, Lana. Tell them that the phone company has finally developed faster-than-light travel, and that we will release it to the public as soon as the United Governments approves our patent. Lana nodded. Perhaps we can salvage something from paradise, Jason whispered. Money is no object. Leslie Watt, reading time, eight minutes. Leslie Watt lives in Oregon, but would like to move to Barcelona. Her Jack Russell Terrier stalks her like they're in some sort of horror movie. She teaches writing at UCLA Extension and writes stories, essays, and novels. Her newest short story collection, Crazy Love, published in July 2008 by Wordcraft of Oregon, received a Publishers Weekly starred review. Visit WattWorld at www.leslieweat.net for news and silly pictures. Her latest tale for us reveals some of the problems a person can have if money is no object. Her sister had laughed when the will revealed Allison had inherited the magic wallet. So, she'd said, you're rich. You pay for the funeral. Allison had stared at Ellen, unable to ask why her older sister had given up the wallet without a fight. They'd rushed at Santa Ana College. Her mother had justified it all by reminding everyone of the hours it had taken to cover the bill for the complications resulting from Allison's cesarean birth. Her boys appeared out of nowhere and asked Allison for twenty dollars each to go paintballing. No, she said, not right now. Why not? they asked. Because, she said, but she knew they would press her until she caved and she couldn't bear the fuss right here, right now. She opened the wallet to count out money into their open palms. Well, Jeff said, guess I'll quit my job. He was right. She could pull his yearly salary in two eight-hour shifts. She'd quit her job at the animal hospital because no one could pay her as much as she could pay herself, but she'd miss some of the work, some of the people, and all of the dogs and cats. They left the hall and headed to the car to drive home. In the back seat, the boys grew tired of fondling their money and began to argue. I'm going to make you eat paint, said the oldest. I'll gog you, said the little one. In your dreams, retorted his brother. They paintballed on opposite teams, and by the end of every game the younger boy was in tears. It was an unfair match. The little one burst into tears now, as if resigned to his fate. "'Where do you want to stop for dinner?' Jeff asked. "'Hard rock! Hard rock!' the boys chanted. They would never again want to go anywhere without a gift shop. The magic wallet had been given to her mother by an aunt, angry after not being invited to the baby's christening. At first the family had viewed it as a gift, and not the curse that it was meant to be. Now it belonged to Allison. She decided to treat herself to a massage the next morning. Her husband was smiling, dreaming, no doubt, of Patek Philippe watches and a bottle of the Macallan sixty-year-old single malt. The children took turns punching each other and stealing one another's money. Allison saw their lives unfold, the childhood bickering that would escalate until the day something as thin as a wallet with a one-dollar bill came between them. Return of Zombie Teen Angst. Reading time, one minute. In the halls, she won't even say hi. She doesn't even know I'm not alive. Mike Allen.